Okay, good to see you again. Uh, we're going to take a look this time at uh, fossils in a changing environment. Uh, for example, I'm going to show you a, sh a video clip here at the beginning. It's going to take a look at Antarctica, which is now covered in ice, uh, but they're going to go hunting for amphibians and dinosaurs, and they found fossils of palm trees and all kinds of other things there. So that's the first clip, and then we're going to talk about uh, how we find other evidence or other evidence that's been found that shows how these how places have been changing. So let's, let's uh, listen to this clip first. So Antarctica is a continent. It has rock and mountains and other things. Uh, we st I'm standing next to one of the big channel sandstones that uh, flowed through this area around 235 million years ago. Um, and we can see a lot of uh, sedimentary structures within the sandstone that tell us how fast the, uh, the water was flowing, how deep the channels were, and uh, in fact, what was being transported down these channels. And of particular interest to us is this, uh, this little part at the base of the channel here. This is the heaviest part of the load that this water was carrying uh, down off the mountains, down onto the floodplains. And in the uh, heaviest part, we can see large clasts um, of, of, in this case, mudstone that has been eroded out by the channel from the floodplain. And in amongst those clasts, we're finding uh, fossil bones. Uh, the bones of uh, mainly amphibians and uh, of uh, dicynodont therapsid uh, reptiles. Uh, we're going to uh, excavate this amphibian lower jaw, which, um, which I found a couple of days ago. Uh, this is what was showing on the surface, and we've now realized that it's continuing on at about uh, a shallow angle, about 35 degrees down into the underlying rock. So it doesn't look like very much on the surface when you find it, but you can see that this white, nice white bone here is exposing itself out of the surrounding sandstone, and it's plunging in this way, and then it appears back over on this side, but once it goes into the rock it actually changes color so it's weathering white but in its natural state in the rock it's actually uh, quite black bone. One of the issues in Antarctica is that the rocks are incredibly hard because normally weathering rock takes place because of water passing through the rock and here there's very little water, little uh, uh, liquid water and so the rocks stay very very hard and, uh, and so what we're doing here now is we're trying to extract this fossil but uh, it's, it's breaking apart, it's very brittle. And so we're gonna apply a little bit of glue and hopefully the glue is gonna work better than it has in the past. Um, it's basically a, a plastic suspended in acetone and as the acetone evaporates off, those plastic beads are, or plastic particles are gonna sort of bond to the bone. Now one of the problems with working with rock that's, that's this hard in this environment is that it's very difficult to get at with, uh, with chisels and you know the normal kinds of tools that we would use uh, back home. It's extremely necessary to have access to tools like this rock saw. So what we usually do in this environment is we try to build these platforms to get them up on these blocks in sections. And it requires us to go down pretty deep, so we rely on this a lot. So what I'm gonna do right now is start this guy up and try and dig out a little block so that we can get underneath the jaw and then pop it up from the bottom. So uh, right here I'm excavating the pelvis of a dicynodont. It's a, uh, we're looking at the outside of a right ilium, so it's sort of the bone that you would put your hands on your hips. That's the bone that we're excavating. Uh, we found it a couple of days ago, and we've been working our way around and getting underneath it, and eventually we're gonna take a chisel and try to lift the whole thing off in one big pop. Okay, so the hip socket would be right here, and it's coming up, and this would be the upper surface of the bone right here. Here we've got a lower jaw of one of these animals which uh, when, I, when, I, um, when I came here I was excavating a piece of bone from this position here and I thought this was fossil wood. You can see this very dark material 
And as I was excavating here, this little block dropped off and to reveal the most beautiful set of amphibian teeth. These are obviously very visible, very showy, but they're very clearly amphibian because you can see these, uh, these grooves going through the center of the tooth. And that's something particular to the labyrinthodont uh, type uh, amphibians. Okay, so this is the Field Museum, which is in Chicago, as well as a couple other uh, universities that are uh, working together to produce that. You heard them uh, back at the beginning, he was talking about the stream flows, applying the principle of uniformitarianism. How did they know how fast it was going? Well, they look at streams today, and they see, okay, how, how big of particles can it be moving? Well, how big did this move? They So they apply what we know from today to determine what was happening back then. And you saw that even in Antarctica, as they showed you the process of finding the the fossils and excavating them, they're finding amphibians, and amphibians don't normally live in places where it's that cold. Okay, so I'm taking a look at your notes. Antarctica today's uh, covered in ice, uh, but the fossils show that in the past it was different. So there's been changes in life in the environment um, uh, over 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 time. Okay, um, now ice cores are one way that they f that they find out. Um, how the earth has changed and what they do is they drill down and they drill with an, an, an open um, uh, drill so that it can uh, bring up the, the ice so you get this this almost like a, a round piece of, of ice this long cylinder of ice comes up and then they take a look inside of that to see uh, what's been going on so for example they've uh, this shows about 11,000 feet worth of ice uh, that they've taken from a variety of places and as they look in 1986 uh, that we find when Chernobyl the uh, nuclear power station in uh, Russia that uh, uh, m melted down sending out a lot of radiation in the air well that gets trapped into the ice and so you see that happening and we can see in 1900 as the industrial revolution is really getting going we can see a big increase in the ice of things like carbon dioxide um, and uh, nitrous oxide and other pollutants that are from the factories. Um, and then as you go back a little bit farther, we can see 1400 AD, right about the time that the Viking colonies in Greenland disappeared, uh, we can see that the earth must have been just a little bit colder, that you get this little ice age, because we're, they're, they find more salt in the ice. So storm, colder oceans, stormier oceans, more salt thrown up onto the ice. And um, then you get back uh, into... Uh, taking a look at uh, climate changes, you can uh, um, see that climate has changed over over time uh, within the ice by taking a look at what gets deposited in there. Um, volcanic activity, so you can uh, this uh, 73,000 uh, before present, uh, the Indonesian volcano erupted, spewing ash all over the earth, including onto the ice fields, and so you see that. So. Um, all this evidence and other types gets trapped into the ice cores and e experts are able to read that and see what's going on. Um, as you uh, take a look around we also see um, these mass extinctions that occur there where 70 75 percent and in, even in uh, in one of them you see up to 90 percent of all the different kinds of living things on earth disappear from the fossil record in a very short period of time. Um, since the, if you look in in, uh, in uh, sand, you don't find dinosaur bones, or at least non-bird dinosaur bones, after the Cretaceous period, between now and the Cretaceous period. They they all disappeared right back in there. In fact, about 50 to, uh, some, well, somewhere around 70% of all kinds of, of living creatures at that time disappeared. It wasn't just dinosaurs. There was stuff disappearing in the oceans and all over uh, the lands. The current explanation for it is... Here's California, here's Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula, is that about a seven mile asteroid from uh, space came down and impacted right about here, made this big uh, crater. You can't see now, it's mostly filled in. The, the experts can uh, take a look and see slumping material and some other things going on uh, down there. And they can they find this crater here. And that, that then threw lots of dust up into the atmosphere, which then cooled the earth and caused uh, some other changes. There might have been some volcan volcanic activity going on at the same, at the same time, too. Um, and that they worked together, ended up 
uh, changing the conditions so much that dinosaurs just weren't able to make it as well as many other creatures, uh, most other creatures at that uh, point in time. So uh, one of the pieces of evidence they find of, for this is all over the earth. They're finding here, right at the end of the Cretaceous rock, you find this level of iridium. Now iridium is an element that's not very common on earth at all, but very common uh, in uh, materials from space. And so when that uh, asteroid, all that dust went in the atmosphere, it then settled back down in a variety of places. And so you find this layer of iridium all over the earth at about the same time period. Okay. Uh, another piece of evidence that uh, scientists uh, use is they use uh, tree rings. Uh, this is uh, a bristlecone pine tree rings, and uh, bristlecone pine is the oldest living uh, single tree. It's about 4,000 years old, or the oldest ones. Uh, and then there's some frost damage on this particular one. They use that to help uh, find when volcanoes erupted, because after large volcanic eruptions, you tend to get a slight cooling of the earth. And up here at the high elevations where the bristle cone pine grows, you get some extra frost, and so you get more frost damage within the cells. Um, tree rings are real useful because they can show you um, the amount of moisture. You can see on this particular example, you can see varying uh, thickness, so you get uh, um, summer growth. Um, and, and then, uh, or spring growth and summer growth and spring growth and then and summer growth. So you get this varying amounts of growth as it uh, goes across here. The closer the tree rings are to each, to each other, the less growth there was. So there might have been a, a drought at that time period or a colder weather at that time period that prevented the tree from growing as much. Um, and then in other places, you get wider tree rings. Um, and during those time the, those time periods, uh, we're probably more precipitation in more favorable climates. Now you have to be careful in some areas. Sometimes you get um, the wider growth because um, the, the tree is younger and just tends to grow faster. You get uh, uh, maybe there is a, a tree that was shading it that was no longer there. But in general, closer rings, less favorable growing conditions. Uh, wider wings, more favorable rings, more favorable growing conditions. Okay. So then I asked you to uh, take a look and say, all right, now what evidence would you look for in this area to see how it looked millions of years ago? So think back to some of these things. You're not going to get ice cores. Uh, we don't have much in the way of glaciers to core right now. Uh, but what you can be looking for is you can look at tree rings. Uh, we do have a lot of tree, trees around this area, You're not gonna, uh, and they'll give an indication of how the uh, what the area was like, uh, and the fossil record. You, they're gonna, you're going to look around and see what kinds of uh, fossils we're going here. So, for example, if you go out to the uh, Dominigoni Dam, the uh, Diamond Valley Lake, uh, and there's a wonderful museum out there full of the fossils they found when they were uh, constructing the dams and, and digging out the, the area for, for the lake out there. And you can see that they're very different animals than what you would might survive in a climate like we have today and so you get evidence of the change there okay so those are a couple things that you can look uh, put down in there so um, each area has not always stayed the same uh, there's been big climate changes over over time and there's evidence of of that you find in ice cores and tree rings uh, and the fossil record Okay, and then there, every once in a while we get this evidence of these mass extinctions, these really large extinctions where most of the, the types of life uh, went away. And there you, you can be looking for things like asteroid collisions or a great increase in the number of um, volcanoes erupting as having worldwide um, impact. Okay. If you need to watch any of it again, go ahead and watch. If you have more questions for me, you can ask in class.